So in part two, we're going to look at the other side of the balance sheet. We've already talked about assets, the, the, the things that were purchased by the company to perform the operations of the business itself. So now we're going to switch and look at where did the money come from to gather these assets. The first thing we can look at is what's referred to as liabilities. Liabilities refers to the money that comes from creditors. So we have two basic formats or two basic time frames, if you will. Current liabilities, by definition, have a lifespan of less than 365 days. Some of them come from a form of business, right, from doing the business itself. But there are other things that come from the accounting process. And if you look at some of the line items here, right, accrued liabilities, uh, deferred credits, deferred federal income taxes, these are all things that come from the accounting process themselves. They're trying to identify something that happened that needs a special twist, if you will, so that we can adequately reflect exactly what happened this year and what the exact picture looks like. Without getting into the accounting, the debits and credits, I think it's kind of difficult to explain exactly what's going on here. And since that's beyond the scope of this class, they are just short-term liabilities most of them will be reversed within 30 to 60 days, so they don't last very long. Non-current liabilities, on the other hand, have very long time frames, right? They could have something to do with the pensions of the company, right? The long-term debt, the bonds of the company. So the current liabilities, as I mentioned, have to be satisfied in one year, or within one operating cycle, which is typically one year. And again, we've mentioned what these particular assets look like. Um, the accrued liabilities down here, these deferred taxes, these are a function of accounting, right? This is just a piece of the long-term debt that is now going to be due this year. It's the current portion that's due this year. So if you kind of think about, uh, in general terms, this isn't exactly right, but if you were making a $400 a month car payment, at the beginning of the year, you would show that for the next year, you would have $4,800 as the current portion of the long-term debt that was due this coming year. That would be the picture that you show. And of course, we can look at the current liabilities here for the company. We can analyze for financial analysis purposes. We really only need to know about accounts payable. Occasionally, companies will have notes payable that are short term in nature. But we, the numbers are usually so small, we usually don't really care too much about uh, that distinction with respect to notes payable. The non-current liabilities then obviously represent things that are for more than one year. So what can those things be? Bonds, long-term notes payable, mortgages. We're gonna talk a little bit here in a second about leases. Leases are a very important part of gathering assets and how we pay for gathering certain kinds of assets. And occur, of course, pensions and warranties that uh, we may have on the assets that we sell um, obviously could be very, very long-term types of, of uh, arrangements and contractual obligations. Let's take a brief second just to talk about non-current liabilities that are referred to as leases. There are two ways to think about leasing. Let's think about, you would like to, 
you would like to clean the rugs in your house. So you go to the grocery store and you rent one of those doctor rug machines. That is a lease arrangement. It's a rental. You're only going to have it for a short period of time and you're going to return it right back to the company. Now, let's change that around. Let's call it a car, right? So let's say when you rent a car for a vacation, say, you're going to have it for, you know, seven days, maybe two weeks. Are you expected to change the oil? Um, are you expected to rotate the tires, buy new tires, right? You're not expected to do anything with those short-term kinds of arrangements. But there are long-term leases. Think about if you're renting a building, right? You're expecting to be in this building for a very long time. So you're going to take out a lease, a rental agreement on this building. Now, if it's a very long period of time, and with certain kinds of contractual obligations, we may want to account for this in a different way. And of course, the accounting rules set out how this is done. The challenge for us as investors and in trying to understand what goes on in a company is we have to understand the implications. One of these line items, one of these leases has a direct impact on the income statement. The other one has an impact on the balance sheet. So there are differences in the way they are disclosed. And how we find that is where we find that are in the notes to the financial statements. So there'll be information in our plant and property equipment notes, and there'll also be a discussion of leases in what are referred to as contingency notes. So this is a place where we can go to find this information that is kind of important. So in the end, we have our long-term debt, which just is a signal of where did the money come from, from creditors in order to purchase the assets for the company. The last section of the balance sheet then refers to stockholder equity, right? This is the shareholder piece. We typically can refer to stockholders as being residual owners. They only get something if something is left over. And for that reason, owners bear the greatest risk from investment. We would also hope then that since they're taking the greatest risks, they should get the greatest rewards. And what we find is in general, the shareholders of a company earn a higher rate of return total than what the creditors earn from their lending us money. Shareholders typically don't receive a fixed return, right? They have voting privileges and they can either benefit or suffer from changes in price appreciation. The dividends of a company are not guaranteed, right? They are declared at the discretion of the board of directors, but I just want to repeat is that they are not guaranteed. So there's a uh, company does not have to make dividend payments if they decide that they don't want to make dividend payments. So one of the last component parts then of this stockholder equity is what's referred to as retained earnings. Retained earnings represent an investment made by shareholders. If you think about it, we own the profits. Some of the profits are paid to us as dividends and some of the profits are reinvested in the company. So retained earnings represents the net amount of profit, my money, that's been reinvested in the company. So again, this is, it isn't a fund of money. It's not a place that there's a pool of money. This already represents money that has already been reinvested, right? So again, it is a, essentially it's a measurement of all the undistributed earnings of the company. 
Well, what did they do with those? They invested them. So how we calculate this is you take the beginning retained earnings and you add all of the net income. Again, this is all my money. This is all my money that was left over from last year. This is the new money that's mine. Subtract out the dividends, the amount that they've already paid me. And then in the end, when you subtract that out, that's going to be the ending retained earnings. And again, I just want to kind of stress, this isn't a fund of money. There's not a pool of dollars somewhere that represent retained earnings. On the balance sheet, this is a source of money. It's my money that's been reinvested already in the company. So let's look at a couple of problems kind of quickly that they come up relative to current, uh, some, some current assets, if you will, right? So here's an inventory problem. And there are typically two ways, sometimes three. Actually, I think in reality, there's probably about five or six different ways you can do inventory. But essentially, we have a couple of ways we can look at it. We can talk about something called FIFO, which is first in, first out. Or we can talk about LIFO, last in, first out. So here's our question, right? We have assets. In the beginning, we started with eight units, and it cost us $5 to buy those units. So obviously, our beginning inventory has a value of $40. We then purchased 10, 14, and 12 units at slightly different prices, obviously slightly different costs. And in the end, we sold 40 units. So here is the first question. How many units did we buy? Well, if you add up the four numbers here, we have purchased 44 units. And the total cost is the sum of these four numbers, and that is $270. So how much, how many units are left over at the end of the period? Well, if we bought 44 and we sold 40, that must mean there are four units left. So if we're talking about FIFO, first in, first out, what is the ending inventory? So the first in or the first out, so that means in FIFO, the last four units are left from this last purchase was $6. So the ending inventory is $24, four units times six. And then the cost of goods sold of these units is the $270 total minus the 24. So cost of goods sold is $246. LIFO is last in, first out. So the four units that are left are going to come from the beginning, not the end. So they're four at $5. So four times five is $20. And the cost of goods sold is $250. Now in this example, it really doesn't illustrate why companies might choose one or the other. We're only talking about $4 difference in inventory. But if inventory uh, is very volatile, right? If the prices here ranged from $3 to $12, it might make a big difference on your income statement and in your, on the balance sheet, certainly of which accounting method you choose. So companies will choose a method that hopefully best represents the values of the assets that they have and the profitability of the company. The last thing we want to do then is just look at a, ask some basic questions about a balance sheet. The total assets are 56,000. Total liabilities are 32,000. Net income 7,500. Beginning retained earnings are 9,800. And ending retained earnings are 10,400. So what questions can we answer? What is stockholder equity? We have a formula that says total assets equals total liabilities minus stockholder equity. So if you solve for stockholder equity, 
subtract total uh, uh, total liabilities from total assets fourteen thousand dollars oops I'm sorry that's not right twenty four thousand dollars is the um, owner equity for this company so what is um, how much dividends were paid well we know what the beginning retained earnings plus net income minus dividends equals ending retained earnings so solving for dividends it turns out that ten thousand four hundred dollars were paid out as dividends so we can ask some simple questions from these basic line item numbers from a financial statement look forward to talk to you in the next video